Like most things, social media can be a force for good or bad. Our guest wields it as a force for good. She speaks directly to women, telling them things they need to hear. Things like, a woman without any flaws only comes in plastic. And love your scars and keep believing. She used to write letters starting with Dear Future Husband, but she now writes Instagram posts describing her husband Arden as both holy and moly. And as she was pregnant with her son, Azariah, she put countless hours into her brilliant new book, Break Up With What Broke You, releasing August 15th. Please welcome to the RO Podcast, Mrs. Christian Bevere. Christian, welcome to the RO Podcast. Thank you. What an introduction. I hope I can live up to the lofty title. <laughs> well, that, I mean, I think actually the lofty title belongs to Arden being, you, you called him Holy Ann Moly. That's, that's something to live up to. I mean, I woke up this morning and just rolled over. This doesn't happen every morning, but I rolled over. I was like, man, you are just such a attractive, <laughs> tall, magnificent guy that snores, but is still just amazing. <laughs> He's that, really incredible. That's really good. I can tell you from experience, the snoring only gets worse. Um, it only gets worse. I'm a few years ahead of you guys. and uh, But that's all right. As long as he keeps, well, uh, yeah, as long as he stays yeah, in the gym, then he can snore all he wants, once, right? I guess so. I mean, the problem is I'm sleep deprived whenever he snores. So <laughs> it's right. like, he doesn't really get worse. I get worse. So I don't know. <laughs> that's right. As long yeah. as he stays with me, I guess I should say. <laughs> that's exactly right. I love that. Well, I, I'm very, very excited to talk about your book. I just, I just read a break up with what broke you again, releasing August 15th. And I know I'm not your intended audience. I know when you wrote this, you weren't thinking, Hey, how about like early to mid forties male? Um, that's not, that's not who you wrote it for, but I, I'll tell you why this was so good for me is because I'm the father of a 13 year old daughter. And, mm. and it's almost as if Christian, almost in, in reading it, it was almost like, Hey, read this before, read this as your daughter's entering the teens because so much of it, and we're going to talk all, you know, the shame, regret and all that kind of stuff. This could be the thing that, you know, a lot of dads wish they would have read. And as you tell your story and you tell like certain stories of regret, which everybody has, it was just so, right. it was just so beautiful. And I felt like really timely for me. So I, I would love to, I'd love to hear a little bit of the, the backstory on how it came to be and then who you were thinking about as you were writing it. Yeah. Well, I can't tell you how liberating that is to hear because I've already been having conversations with my own dad and he's saying things like, I'm so proud of you. I can't wait to read it. And I'm like, thank you. Oh, wait, you're going to have to read some stuff. Oh boy, <laughs> That might be hard. So I think I might give him a book and just cut out chapter two. Okay. I don't know yet. We'll figure it out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's neat how it's hitting different areas and really relating with different people and such a gift. I mean, I started out writing this and without getting forward to questions I know we'll talk about later on, it really was a releasing and a vulnerability, which I'm an Enneagram for, you know, feel however you, you do about that. But I'm naturally, I love to go deep. I love to relate, but I also love the, the beauty of creating. And yeah. sometimes it gets messy and it's hard to know like what is to release and what is to keep, what's to heal and what's to help others heal. So it was uh, liberating to say the least. And as you mentioned, I wrote a lot of it when I was pregnant and newly postpartum with our firstborn. And I'm sure you know, having kids of your own, it's almost a haze yeah. those first few right. months. And so it was really, Holy Spirit, you have to lead me because <laughs> I'm very tired. I can't even see the screen. There's a baby clinging onto me. Um, so just, I, I feel like it was rewalking through some of the journeys and the stories and the testimonies and seeing it with, with fresh eyes, with tired eyes, <laughs> with tear filled eyes. Sometimes a lot of it, Joey still, still gets me. I just read yeah. the audio book not too long ago and just thinking, man, these are really real um, things that teenagers have to come up against. It's really tantalizing almost to see this is where our society is. These are things that almost aren't talked about enough. And when you mentioned the, what was the why behind writing this book? That was it for me. Yeah. I graduated college, came home. I remember sitting on my mom's bedroom floor talking about this happening in college, this happening in my relationships, this happening in my self-worth and just coming to this implosion point of, I wish there was a guide for navigating these emotions, these temptations, these realities of, of what just life and relationships look like. 
and my mom being the, <laughs> I like to say she's randomly prophetic. Like when I met Arden <laughs> on the first date, she was like, oh my goodness, you just met your future husband. Which be careful moms and dads if you say that because you yeah, boy, that can really back, that, that can backfire. Yeah, too. It could, right? yeah. it could. But um, I think moms really have a good awareness <laughs> seeing into people. And she was right. Here we are. Um, but she also said, I think you're going to write a book about this. Now, lo and behold, wow. I did a journalism major, but writing a book was not on my scope. I would never have thought it was possible. But it took four years of writing and rewriting wow. of what would I say to my younger self or what are my younger siblings? Like what are, especially for women, the things that we need to understand that we will face and how to face them well and how to overcome them if we don't manage them well and we're stuck in the cycle of shame. Because for me, mm. it kept me stagnant for years. Even when I was walking in God's presence and his fullness, it just keeps you almost like a grasp and a shackle, uh, forgetting that he is sovereign, that there is grace, and then there is promise ahead, even when we fall short. Yeah, I, I'm, it's in, it's an interesting. I have two questions I was going to ask at the end, but I think it's a, a good time for them. One of them is you mentioned the vulnerability of writing a book. I mean, that's a, and to your point, you do get, and we don't. I think people should read the book to go into your to your story. Um, but that is you're you're disclosing a lot, and to your point you're putting it out in the world and like, it's like world, I hope this helps or I hope you like it or I hope you, I mean, and, and even, I mean, the book is coming out in, you know, in, in a couple of months or, or um, from when we're recording this, but that's got to feel a little eh, like, you know, almost, almost putting in some of those feelings that you describe here. Is that like, well, I hope this, I hope you love it. I hope you love me. I hope mm -hmm. you, can you talk about some of the emotion of, of what it feels like to write a book and put your own story out there and then just hope it's helpful and hope that people like it. All right, maybe not like yeah. it, but, but but I mean, no, there there is the human side of, I hope you like me, but the other side, I know you're doing this to help people. So maybe both, both of those things. Yeah. And I think in the Christian spectrum, it kind of goes hand in hand sometimes where you do have to separate it as, well, I hope this is received well and I hope it helps people. But even if it is just for the one, that yeah. means 99, 9,000 people could dislike it. But what right. is our, mm. what's our purpose in releasing something? Is it obedience and releasing yeah. Or is it validation? Now I am a recovering passive aggressivist <laughs> and perfectionist. <laughs> so um, that is something that I constantly battle. I think the great benefit that I have is being able to see a lot of my family is in the book writing industry. Yeah. Uh, it's a family business, I guess you could say. And I've seen them navigate those internal struggles well. Um, and I've seen the realities that come with it. You know, some my in-laws have written countless books. I want to say maybe it's close to 50 or 60 wow. combined. And there's some that are bestsellers and there's some that uh, flop and then take off. But I've seen them and their encouragement has been to stay consistent and remember the mission behind writing it. But as you said, I think again, specifically as women, wow. uh, our heart is to be received well, especially when we are showing so expose our heart and, um, our care for others, it's, it's not a small thing or even an easy thing to, to steward people well. And I think that's why taking a different route or a different stab at it, when Paul talks about those that teach and those that lead and those that pastor have a greater accountability, it's not just, well, watch out for what you say because God will judge you, but it's, you know, you say every word with care and with intention and you have to be so focused on the person you're shepherding. So as you write, as you're in relationships, as you parent, we constantly have to think on what we're outputting and in the tension of it coming out, remember the focus. And yeah. it's easy, again, for shame to want to say, oh, well, don't say that or only say it in a positive way. Um, even talking about family stuff, I had to think, what of this is going to be me blaming others? What if this is going to be me easier to keep back instead of release? And it's a journey. One, I think that's very unique as we share our testimonies, but that's how we overcome by yeah. the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. So it's important. Yeah. And I put this later in the book too, but everyone has a testimony. I don't want any single person to think, well, if I'm not writing a book, my story doesn't matter. No, your story could change the life of your neighbor, the barista you interact with. So it's something I think we all need to, to work out and have practice in doing. And that, that's a hard thing too, because we all know our, we, we're all a work in progress. We know we're a work in progress. And so it's almost like 
how do you know when it's the right time to tell your story? Cause we don't, you know, we mm-hmm. may, we're right That's in the good. middle of it all the time. So I'm, I'm curious about that. Like, how do you, and, and maybe people who feel slightly sheepish about sharing their story because they see their own faults and they see their own failures and like, ah, oh, my story's not good enough or it's still being written. How do you know when is the right mm-hmm. time to start sharing that story? Yeah, I think that's a really valid point. Unfortunately, we've seen some people, I think, share around a topic that they weren't ready to share around. Yeah. And it comes across as anti-helpful um, because this person's still in the thick of figuring it out. And one thing I will say is a caveat to anyone learning from someone else or learning from their testimony is not, not to see that person as the epitome of perfection of overcoming anxiety or overcoming this, but listen into, oh, God did this journey and this healing. If he can do that, for them, they, he can do it for me because his heart is to care. His heart is to heal. So I think that's the biggest thing is one, let's be more aware in our receptive of receiving and listening. Um, but as we do share to your point, I I think it's always um, God-led and the Holy Spirit-led. To me, there's certain areas of my testimony that I thought years ago I could have shared, but there just either wasn't the prompting, the grace, Um, the allowance, what it may be. Again, four years of writing this book, I wrote about probably 50,000 words. And then my my brilliant publisher was like, what if we did a different area of this or different topics? Let's redo that. And I was like, do you know how hard it is to write (laughs) 10,000 words alone? Yeah, yeah. thanks for pointing Um, out your heart. Yeah, that was really nice of you. But yeah, let's go a different, yeah, right. Talk about that vulnerability, just like spit on it. It's fine. Even saying it the nicest way. Um, But I believe like, God speaks to all of us in different ways and there's the alignment of relationships to to highlight different things. So I have to fully wholeheartedly believe that what's in the book is what's meant to be in the book. Even if I cringe at some stuff and think I could have written that better. Why did I say that? Why didn't I say that? Um, So that's kind of my roundabout way of doing that for myself. Well, I love it because it's so consistent with it's so consistent with the with the theme, which is what you say early on, is that everybody's broken. I mean, if we can if we can acknowledge that, if you can acknowledge, even if you hear great advice or you know you hear mm-hmm. you know great advice, somebody somebody with a lot of experience, you're still hearing it from a broken person. Um, mm-hmm. And and I would love to hear you as you're talking about it. I want to hear about the title, and then maybe specifically within that, when you talk about something that broke you or being broken, how would you how would you um, define that for the reader? What brokenness means? Yeah. Isn't that fun? Would you would you just easily say that to your daughter? I love you. You're broken. It's okay. Yeah, you're broken little <laughs> sweet angel. Yeah. yeah. Just say thank you. Uh, no, I. It's, <laughs> chapter one was one of the last chapters I wrote because wow. I I knew in my heart I want to tackle this topic. I want to talk about this. And essentially, as I was trying to get the title together just brokenness kept coming up. And I was like, no one is going to want to read a book or even identify with being broken. Um, But I think that's part of it. Like we are broken because we are apart from God. And part of understanding that is the allowance for freedom. Hmm. So we think of the journey of sanctification and justification. We have to admit that apart from God, we fall short, that we are sinners, that we need his grace in our life. And I think the same is true is if we want to heal and continue to grow, Whatever area it is, whatever background we're from, however old we are, there has to be an allowance of, well, there's still more ahead to achieve. And I talked about perfectionism earlier, (laughs) writing this book when I wasn't in the perfect state to review it was freeing for me in a lot of ways because there was no level of perfectionism that was able to be achieved, but there is a level of excellence. And in our brokenness, we can strive for excellence without thinking it has to be perfect because perfectionism, again, I also think is tantalizing because how do you reach that mark? How do you become the perfect daughter, the perfect uh, speaker, the perfect author, the perfect wife? There's just no way. But if I admit, okay, I'm broken. There's things I can learn to do better tomorrow. There's an allowance for growth. Mm. I'll never be a perfect mom, a perfect wife. And to me, that is freeing to say because it shows me, but I can keep learning how to do better. Yeah. and be better for the people around me and for myself. I really, I, I love that concept of just, you know, your brokenness, you know, seeking excellence. You can still seek excellence without perfection, which is a really fine line. It's almost like the, mm-hmm. you could see a perfectionist using that as a weapon. Be like, no, it's okay. It's, it's, I'm just seeking excellence. We're like, nah, yeah. you're still yeah. doing the perfectionist thing, aren't you? Self-awareness <laughs> is so key when we talk about these things. 
<laughs> well, and I also think there's a there's a level of isolation for people when they they see their own story and they believe that they're the only ones that are broken. And so you talk mm-hmm. about the freedom in in recognizing that everybody is broken. And and I think do you think that's do you think that is a way that you begin to believe one, maybe your story is not valid or you can't share because you just think you're the only one that loneliness becomes Mm -hmm. a a certain way for you to continue down that shame spiral. Absolutely. Isolation is one of the key ingredients for the enemy to use shame to decom to combat anything that's good growing inside of us. I feel I remember after I married Arden, so many girls coming up to me and just being, you know, asking the question of how did you get a Brevere? How did you get a, a holy and moly guy? <laughs> saying, like, what do you do? What is the X, Y, Z to get the happy ending? And usually they think, well, doing this, being a good Christian girl, you know, all the things that we project onto, we have to be perfect at. Yeah. And I would just, it, it baffled me at first because I thought, who who is that girl that does everything right to get the happy ending? Does it ever really work out that way, especially in dating, to do everything right? And it almost restarted a shame loop of okay, I knew I'd came out of broken relationships, broken image, broken definition of love, and I found a God fearing guy, holy, and walked out so many of the promises that God whispered to me uniquely. Again, there's more in that of that in the book, but got to this point of living in what I call a promise of a happy marriage, marrying to a great man. And then the shame cycle comes back up of, well, you didn't do everything right. Mm. Why do you deserve this? Shouldn't someone else be in your shoes instead of you? And the isolation factor, I just put that all back in and it picked up different roots that I hadn't fully weeded out. And I think that's with shame, we really have to be aware of what roots because it only takes one foothold for the enemy to grow something and to pull on that in so many different ways. And it becomes so weedy that we have to know what are the footholds? What yeah. am I still holding on to? And for me, it was that image of not being enough. And that festered and grew until one day I was driving and I just said, God, this, is, like, this isn't right. I shouldn't be in this relationship. I shouldn't be allowed to be happy. Like, do you know all the things I've wow. done? And he just, as I feel God is a comedic gentleman, he was like, okay, show me the girl that's never messed up. Huh. I was like, I don't, I don't know her, but she's probably like this blonde, beautiful, <laughs> perfect. She's not a brunette because I'm a brunette. And uh, he's like, Christian, that girl does not exist. Hmm. Like everyone needs my grace. Everyone yeah. needs me. And again, that freedom of realizing I'm broken and we all are allowed me to think, okay, anytime I feel shame, that is a reminder for me to remember, wow, God healed me from that. God forgave my sins. God showed me a way to overcome what I thought would overcome me. Hmm. And I really feel like there's a double portion blessing when it comes to shame. If we get out of isolation, we voice it one first with God, because he's going to be able to speak to us the most intimately and profoundly and, um, I want to say clever, but accurate to who we are, but then also with our friends around us that can call out the gold. Because when we feel the shame prongings, uh, we want to retreat. We want to hide. We want to think this is a dirty part of me. I can't let it show or people won't love me. But there are people that love you no matter who you are. And they will say, that's not right. Or if it is something that you're perpetuating, let's get out of that because I see more in you. Yeah. And that's so good for, for people to... For, for to have that circle of people around you who can, whether it's in, in encouragement, Justin Whitmill early talks about friends being friends, encouraging. So when they see, they see something that you should continue to do, that's when the encouragement comes in and then the mm-hmm. rebuke for them to be able to say, like, see something that's leading you towards a danger, a dangerous spot where they can, they can speak that rebuke into you. And so to your point, having those people around you who can do both of mm-hmm. those things is so valuable. Um, I, I want to, uh, again, I want to start with, and you, you hit on such, I mean, there's such poignant topics, just regret, shame, comparison, uh, and breaking up with regret. I, I'm curious, I talked with Jamie Ivey about this recently on the, I grew up in the 90s, just so the purity culture of the 90s. And, and it's, I know, <laughs> for those who are listening, there was a definite cringe on Christian's face. And, and I think the, again, very well-intended but right. it, it became this, 
you, you know, you're, you're a virgin or you're not. And so then it's like mm -hmm. one or the other. And it was such, it was such a, a you know, I think a, a, a misguided, well-intentioned misguided message. And I want, I want to dig into a quote that you have in the book that I thought was really, really strong. And talking about sex, you said, and you talk about the purity messages we're sending. You said, when we put a label on something so valuable, we can make the young girls mm -hmm. afraid of intimacy or in withholding the truth that sex is good within God's intention for it. We can awaken an eagerness in some to prematurely find out how good it is. So how in the heck do I parent a 13 year old girl? <laughs> That's my question, Kristen. What do I do now? <laughs> <laughs> Cinder my way. I, I'm going to heart. she, we're going to have like a week at Christian camp in Nashville here. What do I do? Oh my goodness. It's such a valid question. And you know, what's funny is the book was almost called misguided because that was oh, really? almost the premise of what I felt of like, I had good intentions. There were people leading me with good messages, but it all fell short. And what I think of around the nineties, early two thousands is especially in Christianity, it was a heightened this is the mark, not quite legalistic, but here's mm. the ideal. Yeah. And if you fall short, you're dirt, you got to figure it out. And again, like we're saying, part of that is true. Like we fall short, we're broken. We need to get back to the standard and the image God created for us. But the messaging was fear invoking, I think, rather than uh, glorifying. So when I realized that my relationship with Christ is a relationship, uh, similar to how our relationships with our spouses is like, well, what is the best, purest, most um, radiant version of this relationship? And how do I reciprocate that into my other relationships? It was a manner of striving for something instead of fearing um, becoming less than I was supposed to be. And then now what I'm seeing perpetuated, which is very just saddening to me, is almost an anti-shame world where yes. if you feel it, it's okay. Um, you know, run with your heart, follow your heart, whatever you feel is in there for a reason, but it's so not true. And those are two very uh, drastic areas to navigate sexuality. And without going full depth on that, I actually am recording a, a podcast with a Christian sex therapist mm, <laughs> soon. And I thought, man, there aren't so many questions that could come around <laughs> this. So what if I just ask my audience, the questions they have. And so many women, even my age, were asking that same question of, I've heard sex is bad my whole life. How do you just magically turn it on? Or I've heard this purity message for so long that I am terrified um, to be intimate with my husband one day, even if our relationship is pure. And so what I, and again, I have a son and we're not even close to the birds and the bees talk, <laughs> <laughs> but when I think about it and what we try to model now is a healthy form of God's version of intimacy, of love, of desire. And I think about um, passion being almost like a fire. And in our culture, at least, we live for the high and low moments. There is no real resiliency. It's what can I live for the next high? Or if I feel a low, I just, I'm not comfortable even to sit in this area. Everything needs to be heightened. But when we live at a peaceful moment in our regular lives, it's, well, I'm enjoying my day. I, you know, there's the mundane and the glorious and taking it all as it is and enjoying it. And with our sexuality, I think it needs to reciprocate the flows, the ebbs and flows of life. So I have a passion that I look forward to. It's not this lustful, rip your clothes off. Like that's <laughs> not love, that's lust. Right. So if we look forward to, I can look forward to sex and you're teaching your daughters. We look forward to sex as something that is unifying a husband and wife. It's something that complements a commitment. Now I see so many of my friends, well, so many people that are my peers have a non-committal version of intimacy that they strive for. And it's, you know, it's, it's high highs. It's very passionate and it's exciting and it's a chase, but there's no commitment. Yeah. There's nothing that's lasting with it. But what is lasting is that shame. Mm. And so I think if we can teach people to look forward to not run away from having sex yeah. uh, or not to try to obtain for purity, but to get, not heightened, but increasing excitement for there's a type of bonding agent that you get to have that helps you um, understand just how precious of a gift marriage is. So I think if we can yeah. kind of, that's a complicated, and it's a complicated topic. It's not straightforward, but 
Well, that's why I like it because it, it because it is so nuanced and it's not a I, again back to the I think in in maybe how I grew up it was or in that generation it was you have one talk with your kids and that's it and that answers all the questions <laughs> they understand that's everything yeah, yeah you get it right you have the birds <laughs> yeah. and the bees conversation the right. talk that's one of you know singular the talk and so I think I think your answer there is is illustrates the fact that it's something you need to have an open dialogue about it's something yeah it is something that, because it's nuanced because there's a lot to it. It's just something you you can if you can keep that open door. I do think that's a really important um, way to address it by just having an mm-hmm. ongoing conversation, recognizing all the all the complication to it. Yeah, and I'll say one more thing. I think the modeling that you show with your wife to your daughter is huge because what we're seeing um, in media is the heightened version of the lust yeah. and the one night stands and the what did he say she say and it's like a festering. But when yeah. we show committed, long lasting steady forms of love i can't tell you how how um significant that is in the eyes of children and teenagers yeah. even if they don't act like it is or they act first out right. by it <laughs> exactly <laughs> which they do um, yeah I, I it related to that within the the regret chapter the um you have another line that, that related to dating it says dating should be a time not for exploration but for examination w- will you expound on that a little bit sure and i i'm sad that I'm almost verbalizing. I process so much better in written form. So I'm not trying to just tell all your followers to go get the book. No, that, I'll tell this them. This is no even worry. enjoyable. <laughs> the book is far better. You read sound bites. I was like, oh yeah, that's what I meant when I just spent five minutes talking about it. Um, but for dating, I think examination versus exploration. When we go into dating of, I'm going to find out this person, the more intimate I get with them, or I'm going to find myself through how they treat and validate me it's almost a recipe for disaster because when we go into dating, essentially we're evaluating who is this person, who am I, and how do we complement each other? But rarely, Joey, do I ever hear that as the portrayal of dating. It's, right. well, what does he do? How does he make you feel? Who is he mm-hmm. friends with? And it's all of this, what can I gain and put on my own plate from this relationship? Then we get married and things become you and I, and it's no longer, well, what does he bring to the table? Or what does he do to me? It's what do we do together? And what are we building? What are we creating? And many millennials, I think, are finding themselves two to three years down the road and bored or confused why it's hard, confused why um, it's no longer exciting or they can't really show off their, their spouse as much. And even in high school, I remember friends saying like, oh, so-and-so is dating so-and-so. And it's just like this, it's like a bragging right game yeah. or it's, um, you know, I, I'm following them leading. And I think dating has turned into copycat marriage. Like oh. it's no longer um, courtship. Hmm. Courtship is you're evaluating, you are seeing who this person is, and then you're making a commitment. But now we see people living together or dating for five plus years. I mean, Arden and I are the crazy people that dated very short and had an even shorter engagement (laughs) uh, because we just decided, you know, if we're going to be in a relationship, we're going to be in a relationship. If we're going to care about each other and do life together, we're going to do it actually. And when we blur the lines and we try to put who someone is to validate who we are, we're no longer dating. We mm. are using that person essentially without going too stern into it. Wow. Um, but I think if we go into dating as uh, examination, who are you? What do you believe? What do you stand up for? How do you treat others? We can actually have marriages that, that last the test of time. That's, that's a soundbite right there. That was, that is really, really great. Um, I didn't expect when in reading this book, I didn't expect you to talk about Scooby-Doo, but you did, um, <laughs> which I loved, but by the way, this may have been my favorite part. This is in the breakup with anxiety chapter. This maybe have been my favorite part. It just made so much sense. It's like all of my childhood memories of watching Scooby-Doo made so much more sense. Will you, will you go into that illustration, especially as it relates to fear and anxiety? It's, it's, it's really, really great. Yes. And I didn't expect to be asked about (laughs) Scooby-Doo today, but here we are. Yeah. I talk about Scooby-Doo and I grew up watching it as well. I have a thing for mysteries, Mm -hmm. something about being able to figure them out and the curiosity. Maybe it was just because I watched Scooby-Doo growing up, but I talk about how it's always neat that there's a similar premise in each episode. 
and that is the mystery gang comes up against this stranger or villain and they have to exploit them for who they truly are and it's always often not even um, the type of person the the route that they were chasing them uh, under essentially they unmask that villain for who they truly are now they may be posing as a mummy or a scientist or whoever it is but they take off a mask and they say oh it's Mr. So-and-so or it's blank down the street it's always someone that is less scary than they thought they would be, and often someone they know. So I feel like as we encounter our anxieties and our fears, we need to unmask what we're afraid of because often it's less fearful, it's less scary, it's less mysterious mm. than we're posing it to be, but it's the, the fear and the running away and the unsurety and the lack of control that makes our circumstances uh, overpowering and dehabilitating to us. But when we know we have the weapons we need, that God has already mm -hmm. given us what we need to one, live this life out well, to not be bound by any of our fears, any of the enemy's schemes, just relying on him and walking in the fullness of who we are is the force we need to, to make it through each day, to live this life well, to finish well. So I like to encourage people and you know, it, it's almost weird to me that I wrote one chapter on anxiety because today it is such a big conversation. Yeah. But I even preface this of this isn't going to be a roundabout conversation around anxiety, but it is going to be a tool to navigating your daily fears, your daily anxieties, even just your worries and your stresses. I mean, I think our generation is the most stressed out generation of any preceding it. And a lot of that, I think, is just wanting so much control and wanting to have all the answers and thinking things are heightened when they're really not. But if we take the mask off and take the veil and realize, you know, I, I'm Christian. I'm one person doing one thing one day at a time. It's such a rhythm um, just to live and to walk yeah. in a peace-filled life. And, and then to and to your point, to to expose it, to, to really it, – it takes that, that self-examination – to know what it is that I'm, what it, what is it that I'm feeling? And then mm -hmm. to, to your point, the, the line I love um, in the book, it says the, the mystery gang never defeated any monster they came up against. They exposed them. And so it's, you, you, you feel all this, you know, you may feel anxiety, but oftentimes if you examine it and if you mm -hmm. look at it and then you can put a name to it and then you break it down, you realize, Oh, that's not, that's not what I thought it was, or mm -hmm. I can do something about that. I really like right. that as a tool and it's, it's, it's a really strong one in, in the same chapter you talk about, a, you talk about a, w women using their voice. And yeah. again, this is just me sitting on, you know, the, the couch here with you as my therapist, but tell me, <laughs> tell me about what that process of a, of a young woman, of a woman finding her voice that, that mm -hmm. finding that voice. What is, what is that like? What is that? What should that, and maybe how can we as parents be helpful guides into that process for them? Yeah, I love that you're asking that. And I, the level of care and curiosity you have as a parent, I think that is, um, again, we're all growing. Yeah, it's just because uh, I'm the crappy be one, that's it. No, <laughs> no it's, uh, it's just wanting to do better and be better. But uh, again, do not have the qualifications to be anyone's therapist. But I, can be, <laughs> I can be a friendly, ooh, this was what I did wrong, learn from me. <laughs> I think women having the voice is invaluable. Uh, in the chapter, I talk about how the greatest defense we have is our voice. We think we have to carry a gun or pepper spray. And if you do those things, more power to you. But the most powerful thing, the most readily available tool that you have in your arsenal is your voice. And they say, if someone attacks you, scream, yell for fire. They're not expecting a woman often to be able to combat them and it catches them off guard. So I think we can do this one with the enemy, continue to use our voice, use our testimony. But in another vein of that, a woman, a woman having her voice is knowing who she is, knowing how to speak from a place of authenticity. I think back to my high school days and dating and friendships and um, accolades I was even striving for. So much of it started with, I know who I am. I know what uh, I'm designed for, I know what my talents are, I know what my purpose is. And the more I listen to other people's voices that weren't God spoken or weren't good examples, the less I knew who I was. So my voice started to reciprocate and sound like other people I'd heard. Huh. Well, that's not 
something that's cool. That's not who you should be hanging out with. And so my voice started to sound like something that I didn't actually understand. And when we're speaking and doing things out of character, we are running off course. We're running with no guidelines. We're running with no guidebook. And it's damaging to us. It's damaging to others. And I know that feels like hard and heavy to anyone listening, but it's just a real reality. And again, unmasking, what are the repercussions of me not knowing who I am? What are the repercussions of me just following my feelings or, or the whims that I have? Like, your feelings are valid, but they're not a trajectory. Your identity, your foundation, that's what determines your voice. And so I would say to anyone, and if I could go back to like eighth grade Christian that's interested in writing and books, um, a lot of that I tuned out because people oh. weren't sitting at home reading. They were texting their friends and going to parties. I didn't want to feel left out. I didn't want to feel unlovable or undesirable. So what did I do? I put everything that was really intricate to who God wanted me to be aside and and truly lovable, I think, about me in order to be loved for a second or feel loved from other people. And it's, you know, God redeems all things. And part of the subtitle of the book is How God Rewrites Your Story, because I believe he did uh, rebirth some of the desires and passions that were uh, left dormant by my teenage self. He he brought them back to life in a way that only he could. But there's so many years that I just think that was so wasted. How much more um, in tune with myself could I have been? How many more people could I have reached? How many, um, how much better could my relationships with my parents or my friends be if I had listened to the voice God put inside of me rather than the voices of people that just wanted me to be something for them? Mm. Gosh. That hits, Kristen. That that's that the whole the notion. I wrote it down. You you set aside what was lovable about you in an effort to be loved by others for a moment. Mm-hmm. Man, and and that's I I like that. Just what what do you what was what was unique to you? What was special about you? And being able to embrace that, identify it for a young girl to identify that and then embrace it and then have the courage. I mean, because it does it requires a heck of a lot of a heck of a lot of courage to. Mm-hmm to walk out confidently the things that make you unique Um, because we downplay, we downplay what's unique to us. And I think a lot of times because, because it's, because it comes naturally to us, we think that it's natural to everyone, which it's not. And so Mm -hmm. then as a result and doing it, then recognizing that's, that's something that's unique within you. And then it does require that courage to go walk it out. Yeah. That's really good. Um, I want to talk there, there are other, I'm just going to tease them out the breaking up with comparison, breaking up with shame. So good. I want to talk about a subset just because this is this is my lane here on it. But in the chapter breaking up with the myth of enough, you talk specifically about putting down your phone, which is what our company does. So you knew yeah. you probably wrote that for me. But will you <laughs> will you talk will you talk about that the the value of doing that and how that relates to that myth of enough? Yeah, I love that you guys touch on it, and it is something I think is. Um, specific to each person. Of course, I'm, I'm on social media. A lot of mm-hmm. what I do is on my phone, but there is a fine line. And uh, even for me, I talked about stress earlier. When I get to a point of feeling like I have to do, do, do and consume, that's usually a good flag for me of, okay, we need to take a break. We need to put our phone aside. We recently went to Florida and I can't tell you how many times I was like, I don't know where my phone is, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for me, it's something in practice. I'm trying to be more present over trying to be a perfectionist. Mm -hmm. And that is some messy moments that I see more beauty in now. As I lean into presence over perfection, usually if something was going wrong, I would get stressed and think this isn't going to turn out right. I'm missing the mark. I need to do this. But as I lean into presence, again, almost unmasking, I'm realizing, well, that's not really a big deal. Or I can easily go to plan B even getting ready today uh, for the podcast, I was trying to do my hair and my son is in the adorable stage where he just like pulls my pants legs and it's like, mama, I'm like, I'm just, I can't hold you and curl my hair, but it's okay. We'll, we'll pause. We will be present. I know that you need so much of me. Your brain is developing so much at this young age. Um, and so I just stopped getting ready for a second, half dress, like half makeup and hair done. And he loves playing hide and seek. So I would just run and, and he'd catch me. <laughs> And it's adorable. He has the biggest smile on his face. But as I was doing that, um, 
we have sprayed our house for bugs and this is a little funny moment but um some spiders are still finding their way in and my my husband and I hate that so we're playing hide and seek I'm trying to get ready I know that you know we only have 30 minutes before the podcast starts but I knew okay he just needs me I'm about to be on an hour-long podcast I can take five minutes to be present with him Mm. and as I'm playing hide and seek in our room I see uh, a spider coming in and I'm able to kill it if I would have been rushing and trying to get everything in on my phone, like I would have missed that impeding yeah. danger of that spider. And it's a laughable moment, but I think that's, it's true to how we live our lives. If we're so focused on the next thing and one, we're going to miss out on developing bonds with our children that will help them when they come up to these shame mm-hmm. cycles, to developing relationships. Um, my mom is a hero of sorts to me because she worked so hard uh, she worked two to three jobs when we were growing up. She still coached uh, our tennis teams. Like, she did so much. And some of that was sacrifices she had to make. But I also see is as we're doing so much, I could have put more of an emphasis on our relationship. Um, and again, time was just, was just taken from her. We get that. There's no one's fault for it. Yeah. But there's so much in relationships that I'm like, hmm, if I would have been more present with my family, I probably wouldn't have had to navigate this. And as parents, if we are taking the time of just being aware, you know, you don't have to get rid of your phone. You don't have to sell your company and just stay at home every day. But there are moments and key invitations, I think, to developing bonds with our children, with our spouse, with our friends, to really be grounded. And if we are constantly striving for perfectionism, being on our phone, being too busy to care, we're going to miss out on moments and have more repercussions, I think, because of it. I think we just found the newest RO, RO spokesperson that you, you nailed it. That was, that's so good. Spiders and, and hide and seek. <laughs> Spiders. And, well, that'd be your next book. Spiders and hide and seek. <laughs> um, oh, all right. So Everybody needs to go pick up the book. It's it's out August 15th. Um, I, I want to segue just briefly to your podcast. I, I touched on it on the intro, the Dear Future Husband podcast, which is oh. – um, it's all, it's a lot about, you know, st- you say strategic singleness and positioning yourself for a thriving marriage. Will you talk just a little bit about the podcast, plug it a little bit. It's, it's really, really great and uh, very clear and you get a lot more of, of the goodness you're giving us right here. Absolutely. And it's a pleasure to speak with you today because my heart is to help the younger generation, especially of women to not, again, make the mistakes I've made, but just know more in tune with who they are, what they're worth and how to have those healthy, healthy relationships and not the toxic ones. No one wants that. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Dear Future Husband came out of ways that I prayed for Arden when I was single and really used this, um, uh, the word I want to use, had a guide of something that felt like I have my relationship as something to pray into. Even when I feel single and I'm missing out on everything, which is a common, common, it's a commonality of anyone that's single, uh, even young of, well, so-and-so is being loved and they're in a relationship. What do I have? Or who's validating me? Pray for your future relationship. Put in the the betterment of being your best self now, if or it does or doesn't happen, but steward that even in your singleness. So it's conversations around um, how to understand your identity, how to prepare for marriage, how to not have toxic purity culture, but a um, healthy image of intimacy. And so we cover a lot of conversations like that, things that I don't think are talked about enough, yeah. um, at least in the female to female scope. And it's a a pleasure to get to do that with the women on my community. So I hope anyone listening will join or, or send their daughters my way. I'd love yeah. to be their friend. Yeah. What would be, what, that's actually, that's an interesting question. When, when, what's a good lower age range for someone to listen to that? Uh, Again, this is just me asking therapy. Shouldn't, should my daughter <laughs> listen to it? <laughs> you know, probably five years ago, I would say like 18 and older, but nowadays I would say 12 or 13 year olds yeah. because we, we post hard conversations in a way that's not um, sexualized yeah. or indecent, but it's preparatory. At least mm. that's the aim. Uh, there's so much that we come up against. I mean, we even just did a YouTube video on should you shop at Target or not? And it blew up because people were like, do we know? Do we put our huh. kids in areas where they're going to see images and, and conversations they're not ready for? And I think a lot of that is stewarding your home, but also just readying your arsenal with tools of, I understand this in a healthy way. We're not awakening love before the right time, but we're having yeah. an understanding of what love is. So yeah, um, yeah. 
That's well, great. I'll hang out with your daughter. Heck yeah. <laughs> but yeah I'm, no, I'm sending her over. Um, <laughs> so uh, the last question, I, I, I prepped you for this a little bit, but um, we're all about intentionality, inspiring people towards intentionality, giving them the tools towards intentionality. What would you say are, are some of your top intentions right now, the things that you're you're working on for yourself? Yeah, which I, I really admire that you guys do that. And it's not always an easy thing. So thank yeah. you for uh, reminding us all to be intentional. My one intention I mentioned is being more present over perfectionist. Uh, to me, that takes on different scopes in my work and my household. Something that's really pointed to me right now, especially launching a first book. It's not always New York Times bestseller, but it is, again, the stewardship. And something I'm trying to remember is, am I going to be faithful with the people and the projects that God has given me? Or am I constantly just going to ask for more? Going back to social media, it's hard to not take the number game into account or take others accolades and think we're missing the mark, but just remembering what God has for you and what he calls you to, he asks you to be faithful to. He's not going to increase um, or add on to something that you're not stewarding well. So I'm trying to be more um, present and faithful with what I have in front of me. Some days that is just my 10 month old and we're just, you know, doing bath time and reading books, but, and then some days it's, joining podcasts with you and, and, and speaking to women. So being present where I am, not worrying about the other moments, but doing the best of what I can. That's probably yeah. my biggest intention right now. And it's not always easy. I want to say that as, as a caveat, yeah. but intentionality wouldn't um, be a thing if it was easy. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so people need to go listen to Dear Future Husband podcast. They need to go buy. We're going to launch this episode August 8th, one week before the book launches on August 15th. So everybody go get a copy of Break Up With What Broke You. Go to ChristianBevere.com. Follow uh, Christian on Instagram at Mrs. Christian Bevere. What did I miss? Yes. Did, did I nail it all? I think you got it all. And all. if not, that's just, it's a lot of things. Yeah. We can leave them with that. <laughs> Don't need to overwhelm neat. them. <laughs> we'll put all this in the show notes. And Christy, I want to say something to you here at the end as the, the dad of a 13 year old girl. And just as somebody who cares about people, I just want to, I just want to thank you for the message you're sending. And I want to encourage you with this. Keep saying it, keep saying it again and again and again and again. And even when you start feel feeling like, you sound like a broken record, or if I said this before, keep saying it again and again. You can't, so the, the things that you say, you can't say enough. And um, thank you for, for the message you have. Thank you for saying it over and over. And I just want to encourage you, just keep saying it. And thank you for this book. Thank you, Joey. That really hits home and means a lot and um, puts some fire under my wings. So <laughs> I appreciate that. Absolutely. Christian, thank you so much for joining us this week on the RO Podcast. Mm -hmm.